stop having your limiting beliefs and worse don't do the worst thing is don't impart those limiting beliefs onto other people that's between you and god and i remember freaking out because the lady told me it's two thousand dollars like what the coolest part about being here in dallas is that you don't know who's packing no 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 rolling for cedar voice ain't no more bleacher never short stopping now i'm winning like i'm jita steady through the rigor yeah i'm getting bigger was fighting in them trenches now i'm making seven figures like what's cracking everybody my name is smart guy matt Zapala here healing to you from dallas texas back from the breakers hotel in miami after spending a weekend with my mentor uh, at his birthday party, as well as a leadership retreat at the Breakers. So I'm here to answer your questions on what you put down on the comments in the comment section on the YouTube channel. So let's answer some of your questions. So let's go. Kiss K asks, what advice would you give a single mother of three that is having a hard time finding the resources to succeed when I have no help and can only stay home and take care of my children? How do I change my circumstances so I can be the first to break this generational curse? Gotcha. Well, you're talking... To me, because I was a single father at one point with three kids. Um, you know, the reality is you've got to find some way to make money. If you're all alone, I didn't have any help. The mother of my three kids wasn't helping, zero assistance. And I was refusing to ask for any government assistance. I wasn't going to the VA for anything. I wasn't going to unemployment check. I wasn't going to do any of that. For me, I thought that was just a waste of time because I could take creative use of that time and find a way to generate income. I found a way to start a business. I had found this little skill called having an insurance license and learning how to sell. I started making phone calls at home, started cranking appointments, setting up appointments. Um, and then I'd set up uh, follow-up meetings at uh, IHOP or Starbucks or wherever the case may be. And I started closing business, but I needed to find a babysitter in the meantime so I could leave. Uh, school is very helpful to me because I can drop my kids off at uh, 9 o'clock, pick them up at 3, uh, uh, 3.30. And I was able to work a part-time job at GVLube. I was able to work a part-time job at Olive Garden, pick the kids up at 3, 3.30, and it'd be a normal you know, evening, dinner, and homework, and church, and kids' activities after that. But you've got to find a way. you got to buckle down right now to find a way to make it happen. I know that's not the easy answer. It's a tough answer. But at the end of the day, if you've got no help, the other side isn't helping, family isn't helping, I was in the same situation. And if I can make it out, you can make it out, especially when there's so many people today using social media uh, outlets. You can create so many different uh, areas of content, you know, we've TikTok and YouTube and different ways to monetize and sell through uh, social media. So go out and find yourself a skill set and go and sell something. You know, uh, I sold insurance. I sold, you know, food at Olive Garden. You got to find a way to sell something. So therefore you can maximize the time that you have with your children. And the best part or the hardest part, I should say, is not having your children feel that you're being disrupted. Make sure that everything's cool. Everything's calm. Do not complain about the other parent. Don't complain about your other situation because then you're transferring to them what it's like to live life that mommy uh, attacks life by complaining and blaming and pointing a finger at other people. You are in a situation you're in for the decisions you've made, the consequence you got to face and deal with. Again, it's not an easy answer. It's the tough answer. It's the right answer. You got to deal with your situation. But I'm sure if a guy like me can figure it out, you can figure it out. I'll be praying for you. Let me know what happens. Joe's Devo asks, okay, sounds good. But how come I have not read anything about the apostles taking effort to become millionaires? Keep reading the Bible. I mean, uh, just because you haven't read any of the apostles doing anything to become millionaires, there's so many different other scriptures that indicate that uh, you are empowered to be a steward, that you are a person that's blessed with talents and, and, and a journey, a dream, a gift. Just because the apostles didn't do it doesn't mean that God didn't place a dream or an opportunity in front of you for you to do something about it. So don't use the fact that you haven't read the apostles becoming millionaires or becoming wealth builders or whatever the case may be. And by the way, you know what it takes to build a, a basketball team or you may not you may uh, uh, know what it takes to build a, a small group or a ministry or some form of uh, community service or community work it takes organizing skills it takes money it takes marketing it takes advertising it takes people spreading the word and guess what buddy that costs money and so even though they have no specific scriptures of apostles out there having to spend money to get the word out to spread the ministry, I'm sure in the actual reality of the execution of that work, money had to be made, money had to be spent, and uh, they had some community partners, they had some kingdom builders in the midst that were helping fund and finance 
their ministry to let the word of God be known. So stop having your limiting beliefs and worse, don't do the worst thing is don't impart those limiting beliefs onto other people. That's between you and God, or whether or not you want God to, to, to inspire you to the next financial level of your life or not. That's between you and God. It's not for you to splash that limiting belief to other people. So we'll continue to pray for you. And I hope you continue to pray for yourself and find out where God wants to place you and use you in your life. Dwight Rivera asks, how does a millionaire think about tithing or giving? And does that play a role in a faith-based millionaire's prosperity? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. By the way, it's just, uh, not just tithing of money. It's uh, time, it's talent, it's resources. What do you do when you get up first thing in the morning? Do you go up and just check email, check Facebook, check, check Instagram? Do you get up in a spirit of prayer and you meditate and you ask God what he wants you to do with the day that you have ahead for him and same thing too with your talents. Uh, are you using your talents and skills and abilities and education just for me, myself, and I? Or are you using that to bless other people, to give back to the community, give back to God's people? Uh, resources, which is finances, which is, which is uh, you know, uh, the, the things that you can bless your way and opportunities and doors that you can crack open for other people. You know, I just relocated here to Dallas, but just because I'm relocated here to Dallas doesn't mean I don't take ownership and take proper stewardship of just being here in a great city to network and refer people to business and, and do business with other people. I've done business with, I don't know, 15, 20 other people already here. Uh, not because I can buy things, because I know by me purchasing, for example, we bought two cars as soon as we got here. I wanted the dealerships to know that we're entrepreneurs in the area, that we can buy cars. I wanted salespeople to know that they can come to our office, that we're here to help. I did business with uh, Jay Lombardo to, for, for tailored suits. We've done business with uh, somebody who could help me hang TVs who happened to be a Afghanistan interpreter. So there's so many different ways, and we helped them with uh, with a video, with an interview, to make sure that people knew about what was really going on with the Afghani experience, what was going on with the uh, the fall of uh, Kabul, uh, when, when uh, the Taliban took over from an Afghanistan interpreter that interpreted for America. So there's so many things you can do with your time, talent, and resources is just not tithing and offering of finances. It's tithing, it's tithes and offerings of your entire life. So consider that. Next question. Spring Ting asks, and this is referring to the interview you had with Rabbi Lappin. Okay. What's wrong with the rabbi friend who retired? I got a feeling that this rabbi is no different from anybody else. Just go for the money. I know why Jesus now decided to walk away from the Jewish tribe. He really wanted to teach spirituality. <laughs> That's your opinion. I don't think that uh, that was the situation. You know, when, when you're looking at Rabbi Lapin, you can be very judgmental in your comments. And, oh, I know this. But listen, get to know the guy. I got to know the guy. My recommendation, you get to know him. You get to know certain things. And don't put a blanket statement because of Jewish people and what Jesus did this and Jesus did that. Listen, at the end of the day, Jesus still loves Jewish people. He was a rabbi himself. Okay. So when you're looking at Rabbi Lapp and, and his concept of retirement, that's what they're asking that question is concept of retirement. The con the concept and the context of retirement is that you're done working, that you're no longer being used as a vessel for God to help and serve other people because you just want to stay home and retire the remote control, me, myself, and I, and deal with your own life. Listen, your life was here to bless other people. You know, uh, crazy as this may sound, that I believe I'm even on my deathbed. I'm making sure I'm connecting and making sure other people are being helped and people still being served and making sure that the people I love and care about are, are being set up for the next level of life after me, even on my deathbed. And at that time, boom, I check out. That's when God takes me home. Crazy as may may, may seem, but that's how I'm thinking. Because retirement, it, to me, is just a concept that was created by a president, Fred, uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1935, when they were establishing a retirement age to create this thing called Social Security. There's no Social Security in the Bible. There's no social program in, in, in the Bible, such as getting a check from the government every month to supplement or, or for some people fully fund their retirement. There's no such program that I read about in the Bible. And if so, please let me know. But when it comes to those situations of the concept of retirement, you, Rabbi Lappin, I think that's a very judgmental comment. And uh, I think you need to look into the matter before you make those type of opinions. And especially, uh, I'm, I'm glad you voiced it here in the comment section. But uh, you know, I, I, I you know, recommend you read about Rabbi Lappin, his journey, his walk, and the perspective and context of what she was coming from. So please consider that. Do you yourself tithe and give authority? Yes. Next question. Simple. Sheena DuPont asks, this causes people to seek money and not God, in my opinion. Why not seek him for his goodness? 
Why not teach people to see God because he's worthy? I know money is essential, but this message is not glorifying God, it's glorifying money. I mean, don't, I mean no disrespect, but I'm bothered by that. Yeah, the last thing, you, if you get to know who I am and st stick around and get to know our content, you're going to very quickly understand it's not about glorifying money. That the proper handling of finances and ha handling of your responsibilities, handling of your family, handling all aspects of the life that you've been given, that is glorifying God. It's not glorifying money. You have, with that being said, a stewardship responsibility that the things that have been given your way, education, health, money, relationships, family, you have a stewardship responsibility because much has been given to you. Sadly, if you don't take care of it, it can be taken away. And that's the thing I fear. That's the thing I respect in my life, that if God gives, he can also take away. If I do well with it and I steward it and I take care of it and I manifest and I multiply it, you know, God says, in my opinion, and it's biblically said, hey man, here's more. Parable of the talents. Please consider watching this episode here of the Bible story that changed my life and made me millions because I decided to honor God's story, to honor a metaphor and an analogy that he was using to bless my life and handling time, talent, money, resources, because I want to be that type of servant that the master says, okay, based on your ability, I'm not going to give you one talent. I'm not going to give you three talents. I'm going to give you five talents because I know you're balling out and I want you to multiply this to 10. I want to be that guy because scripture said they were given money and talent according to their ability. So I want to make sure I maximize my talent. I, excuse me. I maximize my ability. So therefore the talents slash money can we give my way because I know that's just a bigger blessing to other people. So please, I implore you, do not think that the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel is about glorifying money. It is 100% about glorifying God with what we do with our finance because I believe what we've been given is a gift. What we've been given is entrusted to us. It's up to us to be proper stewards of what has been given our way. So please consider that. Francisco Cruz asks, you mentioned standards and expectations in the interview with uh, Daniel Kwok. What are some standards and expectations you've set for yourself? You know, there's many areas of my life, you know, family, <laughs> it's a big one's big one's family, that even though I have adult children, I have a 26 year old son, I have 20 year old daughters that are twins, I have a uh, 11 year old son and I have a two and a half. There's different standards and expectations for all of them at different age groups. So it's not all the same. I expect my older kids to respect myself as a role in their life as a father. I'm not their friend. I'm here to be a father first, a friend second. Um, I'm here to hold up those standards and expectations that, listen, at the end of the day, you're God's ch uh, child and son and daughter, not mine. It's, you just been trusted to me. And I find that as an honor, and I will do my job as a father and as a dad according to God's will and God's ways and rules and regulations. And if you think that I'm here just to be liked by you, you got to think that, you're wrong about that because I'm here to make sure I don't please you as my son or daughter. I'm here to please God. In the pleasing of God, I'm pleasing you. You may not like it because it deals with discipline. And there's so many different scriptures as it relates to discipline in the Bible. And so, same thing to my 11-year-old son. The same thing too when I, I told my kids that when their youngest brother was born, the standard expectation was, listen, he's a, he's a baby boy. Uh, you were raised in an era where I was flat broke building up my company where before I became a multimillionaire, but now that your little brother is being raised by a multimillionaire and not the flat broke father that you knew, you can't have the same expectation standards that you were raised with with him because I'm a different space. And that should sell you, children, that your father has an opportunity to give you uh, uh, your inheritance long before I pass away, the inheritance of wisdom, the inheritance of experiences. And if you have a business plan, I want you to live on some of this financial inheritance long before I pass away. I want to fund and finance some of your goals and some of your dreams, but you got to come together with a business plan. You got to come together with a proof of concept. You got to come together with sales abilities and marketing abilities to make sure you get the product or service out there because I want to make sure I probably steward over my finances too as well. Kids, you have a different FICO credit score with me. So, you know, game on. So talk to your father. So those are some standards and expectations that we have inside our family. Standards and expectations I have with my wife. Uh, when we're out in public, there's boundaries that she and I uh, put together to make sure that we don't violate trust between the two. We're, we're in very much social settings that we're very careful of how we hug people because we're very touchy-feely type people. That how we hug people, we don't violate and 
uh, violate certain standards, expectations of how we have physical contact with people in public, whether it's in fun, uh, standards, expectation when it comes to uh, 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 eating or drinking, those those type of things, whether we have wine or we don't have wine, uh, have dessert or who pays for the bill, those type of standards, expectations, those are just very few I've had. But I believe once you have standards and expectations in your life, you're also going to establish values and principles that you stand for, as well as love and forgiveness and gratitude. And obviously, the other part of that is skill sets that you got to establish inside your life. But those are some of the things that I have in my life that have helped me avoid a lot of unnecessary grief and attract more out of life what I look forward to experiencing. So please consider that. Michael Vang asks, how do you discover your God-given skills or calling? Listen, I never thought I'd be in the insurance industry after a million years. I'd ever be in, inside this industry. Never thought about it. But I stumbled across what I'm doing today because I went through a very tough financial time of my life. I went through a very tough emotional, spiritual, slash traumatic uh, position in my life where what I had available was an opportunity to get involved in a field that made a lot of money in a short period of time and I didn't need a college degree. And in the doing of that, guess what I discovered? Man, there are some God-given skills and abilities that I never knew I really had until I got put through the pressure, until I got tested, until I got drawn through the ringer. So that's possibly it. Your answer for you is that you got to have a test to have a testimony. And don't think that life is just going to be easy and rose garden, everything's tulips and dandelions, all that type of stuff. You're going to go through some tough times. You're going to go through some issues. You're going to have, you're going to have you know, certain things just mess with your mind and your spirit and your heart, your money. People that you never thought would stab you in the back, stab you in the back. People never, that you never thought you can trust, you can find out that you can trust. So certain things will happen in your life. And in that process, my friend, you're going to discover your God-given purpose, talents. I don't wish any ill will on you, but all I know is that everybody that I've experienced that's became first-generation cash flow millionaires or had any form of success in their life, they had to go through a trial and a tribulation. My suggestion is read the book of Job. Uh, read the book of Job in the Bible and get back with me in the comment section what your biggest takeaway was reading from the book of Job. So consider that. B. Miller asks, I love the efforts, but how can we be successful while spending less time away from family? How do I? How do you balance money and time? What if we made less money and spent more time with family? That's true. I mean, there, there's consequences to everything, right? But, uh, you know, I don't believe in balance. I don't believe that, uh, you know, you have to take away from one... Uh, aspect to gain another. Uh, I do believe in this thing called integration. You know, I remember Ivan, we went to uh, Orlando. You know, I had a, fa I had a fast start school, I had a leadership uh, retreat with some of my guys in Orlando and I brought my kids with me. They went out to Orlando. After that, we went to, after I did my work, uh, training and teaching, coaching and, and leading. We went out to uh, uh, Orlando, what is it? Uh, uh, Universal Studios. And you remember, we had, we had only one day to do it. You remember that experience? And I'm like, we need to get the passes, the fast passes. So we had to get the fast passes. And I remember freaking out because the lady told me it's $2,000. Like, what? Yes, if you want access to Universal Studios and the fast passes, so therefore you don't have to stand in line, it's two grand. I'm like, what? Are you, are you kidding me? But it wasn't the fact that I didn't have the money. It was the principle of whether I felt that my... Family should have access to all these different experiences. And the one day that we had, and by the way, these kids had a blast. We went, I took photos. I remember having to hold my son the whole entire time. He was crying through the, the Simpsons. Uh, he was crying through uh, Shrek. Uh, we were hot. We were sweaty, but we had a blast. And that's an experience that we still bring up to this day. We don't forget those things. And that will live now for the rest of their lives. So I don't believe uh, that you have to trade off one, cut loose one, so therefore you can have more in here. I think you can integrate both and enjoy both. I mean, my daughter was just speaking on the MGM Grand Stage because her father was the last minute speaker for this conference. And I walked her up on stage and I had her talk about what it was like to live her life as a daughter, live a life of a millionaire, live the life of an entrepreneur. And she shared a spoken word poem in front of 10,000 people. So was a payoff of the long weekends, the long uh, weekends, uh, the, the, the the closeouts, the Friday nights, was it worth it? You got to ask yourself, if I'm paying the price, is the outcome going to be worth it? That's something you got to process. 
And you got to figure out whether or not it's something that you want in your life, something that you feel that God's placed in your heart to experience and to, to grow and to manifest, something that you need to pray about. Because there's nothing wrong with having an average and ordinary life. There's nothing wrong with making X amount of money. You don't have to be a first generation cash flow millionaire. I'm telling you this. But if you want access, you want the, 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 the things that the best that life has to offer, you can't go around in life thinking that, oh, you know what, I'm going to use God as an excuse not for me to get better, invest more time in learning a skill and actually executing upon that opportunity. Um, I've just used those opportunities to grow and, and take what God has given me and to scale and scale and scale and scale and execute and experience new different levels along the way. So uh, praying for you and your journey. So please consider that. 20 Kevron asks, do you still operate your business? 100%. 100%. This is my day. Uh, I'm actually staying in my office right now. This is my day job. I run a national financial service organization. I have 2,500 agents from coast to coast, east, north, south, west, midwest, we got it all. So I'm in the insurance industry and 100%. I absolutely run a business and we're just getting started. So thanks for asking. Gato Perata asks, did you study business? Do you have a college or university degree, please? No, 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 no. But I did study business. Listen, I may not have a formal education in business, like college degree or master's degree, but I did study. I do. I did. I do study business till today. I learned a lot from documentaries, biographies. I learned a lot from case studies, and I learned a lot just from doing it and making a lot of mistakes along the way too, as well. So, you know, that's that's how I learned. It's called the school of hard knocks. JDC Enterprise Consulting Inc. asks, "I'm from Chicago, also. Cool. But what made you want to make that move?" To Dallas and why did you feel like it was the right one uh, number one I was already commuting down here I've got operations already here in Dallas I've been doing that for the last three years um, number two uh, I just got sick and tired of the cold <laughs> I hope you can relate man there's nothing like uh, going outside in Chicago and it being negative 20 degrees outside and you still got to shovel snow and de-ice your driveway there's nothing fun about that and plus uh, I'm at an age right now where my achiness and my bones and my joints for me um, when I got to wear five different long johns and pants, it just, you know, it's a long waste of time. And from a health perspective, it's better for me to be here in Dallas. And number three, the opportunity here of being in Dallas, the political environment here, the fact that this is a red state, the fact that uh, uh, so many people don't jack you up about uh, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, masked or unmasked, whether you vote or not vote, you're Republican or Democrat, there's so much more freedom here that I'm experiencing in Dallas, Texas versus the areas up in uh, Chicago that I was at. And by the way, when I left Chicago, speaking of that, when I left Chicago, that night I left Chicago, this Puerto Rican couple sadly was yanked out. It made national news. This Puerto Rican couple celebrating Puerto Rican, uh, the Puerto Rican festival. It made national news. They got yanked out of the car and in the middle of the street, they got gunned down. And so that's the type of environment I don't want my kids at in Chicago. And the coolest part about being here in Dallas is that you don't know who's packing. <laughs> like you don't know who's carrying. And I think that that naturally is a deterrent for people to do, to do some due process and, and thinking whether or not they can do some dumb things or not. Uh, and, and not to say that's not going to happen, but uh, I feel more safer if I'm in a position where there's more people around me that's taking responsible care of their firearm uh, versus the gangsters in Chicago are the only ones with the firearms. So I love being here in Dallas. I love the, the, the weather. I love the people. I love the environment. I love uh, the fact that uh, there's no traffic. Unlike Chicago or LA or New York, nothing like those three cities. So D Town is my new home. So thanks for asking. Maybe you, you come down and visit us here in Dallas, Texas. Our new office is going to be right down the street here in Carrollton, Texas. So uh, once we post a new address, uh, we're, tomorrow we're signing our new lease and we're going to be praying about our new office before they lay down new tiles and paint and drywall. So uh, we'll keep you posted, but thanks for asking. And then the last question, which is a pretty important one How do you define a cash flow millionaire? Cash flow million, you make seven figures of income cash flow after expenses. That's how we define a cash flow million. You are in control of your income coming in. Your money is not controlled because you got to buy something and sell something. Your money is not controlled by uh, it being in equity and hopefully you got to either sell or refinance something to get your millions. No, you got millions of dollars of income coming in month in, month out. And that is being a first generation, that is being a first generation cash flow millionaire. And I hope that you become one too. So I appreciate your questions. I'm here to answer them for you. Before I let you go, please check out these two other videos here where I answer your questions at the same time too as well. If you've got more questions and follow-ups to these, drop it in the comments section below. As many of you may or may not know, our next goal is to get to 150,000 subs 
So therefore, we can award a church charity or a nonprofit $5,000 from this YouTube channel on your behalf. But we got to do that once you grow us 150,000 subs. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you share these videos and you too also subscribe. That being said, here from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Thank <laughs> you.